five years ago in the winter of uh, 2009, Michael Parks and I wandered around the, uh, the rural climes of uh, Central California talking to editors and trying to convince them to work with us, to partner with us on stories about health care. Uh, we got a chilly reception. Why should we partner with you, they asked, and what is your agenda, and uh, who is this uh, uh, new operation you're heading, and what is this new journalism thing? Well, five years later, uh, the Center for Health Reporting is now a major player in healthcare journalism in the state of California. And I'm going to talk to you about what we are, and why we are, and uh, who we are. So again, we started in 2009 with a three-year grant from the California Healthcare Foundation. Uh, our mission was to partner with California media, large and small, to tell in-depth healthcare policy stories that matter to Californians. Uh, the why of this, as I said, is, is mainstream media and other media have experienced, as all of us know, enormous cutbacks in their budgets. And one of the first things to go, we discovered, were healthcare beats. So there were no healthcare reporters uh, on most of the uh, medium range and smaller papers in the, in the uh, state. Uh, most NPR affiliates had no health reporter. Uh, so there was a gap that desperately needed to be filled, especially in the time of, of enormous turmoil in the healthcare arena. Who are we? We are seven professional journalists who fan out around the state and partner with these organizations, large and small, both uh, newspapers, online sites, and NPR affiliates to help them tell these stories of interest to their readers and listeners. Since uh, our founding, the center has produced more than 100 projects and articles on healthcare policy. And where have we produced them? We have worked with the largest papers in the state, LA Times, Sacramento Bee, San Jose Mercury News, San Francisco Chronicle, UT San Diego, and we work with some of the smallest papers in the state, the Merced Sun Star, the Santa Cruz Sentinel, and the, let's think what else, uh, the Stockton Record. Uh, we've also worked with online sites, we've worked with ethnic media, and we've worked with NPR affiliates, both across the state and nationally. Now, what about impact, you say? And that's the bottom line of this uh, kind of work. We aren't just telling these stories for our pleasure. Uh, I'm going to invoke the old media slogan here, show, not tell. So I want to run through this uh, presentation to show you what we have done over these last five years. And I've divided the work into some arbitrary categories, but they're very handy to try to illustrate the stories that we've undertaken. So I'm going to start with what else. Obamacare. Uh, and let me start with uh, this story. This was a multimedia effort that we, that we undertook uh, for the Lang newspaper group. That's, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's nine newspapers in the, uh, in the Southern California area, mostly LA County, but also San Bernardino County. Uh, it was our first purely multimedia effort. It had uh, no words with it, really. This was a uh, story we stumbled on, health reform in Hollywood. This is a community nobody ever thought about in terms of, of Obamacare, and this is the talent community, performers, many of whom, as you probably know, have very sporadic employment throughout the year, and, and oft times are making salaries and income that put them right in the bullseye of Obamacare. So for them, Obamacare was a potential savior. These were, a lot of these uh, uh, talented individuals did physical work in the industry as this young woman did. She's a dancer who had no health coverage and had health issues. This was a story that we told out of Tulare County. This county had the highest percentage of uninsured residents of any county in California. And one of the highest of any county in the United States. And we went there to find out how Obamacare was going to play, how it was going to roll out there. And we found that people, frankly, were excited about the possibility of, of Obamacare's coming. And 
uh, a bit to our shock, the uh, county community clinics and county health officials were prepared for this. They were getting ready for Obamacare to come and, and help ensure a number of these uh, uh, people who up to now had had no coverage whatsoever. On the other hand, this was a story we did for the Bakersfield Californian, Desperate for Doctors. We, we looked into what kind of access uh, newly insurance carded people would have to physicians, to medical care. And sadly, our conclusion was they wouldn't have much, that it was going to be a real difficult pull to find doctors to care for this newly insured population. It's one thing to give somebody a card. It's another thing to find them a doctor. And this is a, uh, an enormous success for us at the center. A year ago, almost exactly a year ago, it was August 9 was the, I'm sorry, April 9 was the first uh, publication. Uh, we asked one of our senior writers, Emily Bazar, to undertake a new project. Uh, we wanted her to write a consumer column about Obamacare. She undertook this, and uh, we didn't know how it would turn out. Would we have two clients? Would we have three partners? What would, ha what would happen? Well, a year later, we have between 25 and 30 state media organizations, both a number of major uh, 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 newspapers and newspaper chains, as well as uh, NPR stations all around the state who publish uh, her work on their website. She simply takes questions from consumers and now has received well over 1,500 of them uh, and sorts through them for the ones that have the broadest reach uh, and write and investigates those questions and has found, of course, that Obamacare is one of the longest laws you're ever going to read, thousands of pages or at least over 1,000 pages, and, uh, and there are a lot of perplexities and, and contradictions in law. And officialdom, uh, she knows them all by first name now, uh, consistently give opposing answers to the questions that she asks. So it takes a lot of work on her part to ferret out, uh, to suss out the, the, the real answer to the questions that her consumer readers and listeners uh, ask her. These are just some examples of some of her columns. Now this, I, am, I'm, I think I'm going to be unable to show this because uh, I don't think we have the uh, voice, uh, the audio. But one of the things that we undertook was we put Emily on the road. There was so much demand for her from civic groups and others around the state that we decided, well, if we had the right situation, we'd go for this. The right situation took place in Modesto, California in the uh, middle of September last year. And we didn't know if we'd have 10 people or 100 people. It turned out we had more than 350 people who showed up to this night meeting. We collaborated in this one with the local newspaper, the Modesto Bee, with the community college, and with the League of Women Voters. And the result was this enormous outpouring of uh, people. It was standing, literally, you can see, standing room only, uh, to hear Emily address them about their concerns. Uh, I remember one thing she asked. She, asked, she took a quick survey, in-house survey, of how many people were uninsured. An enormous number of hands went up in this audience. Like 50 hands went up of people who were not insured. And she said to them, well, that's why you're here. So again, unmitigated success uh, with this column. Now let's go to another. That's, that's our Obamacare coverage. And I, I can assure you that's going to be ongoing this year as Obamacare rolls out. We will be all over that story. Uh, but let me tell you about a couple of other categories that we played uh, an important role in. This is uh, about children. This was a. Uh, story we did about, uh, even though there have been enormous advances in, in getting paint out of, I'm sorry, lead out of paint, uh, there remain in a lot of areas around the state, uh, especially in areas where, uh, low income areas where a lot of the housing is 20, 30, 50 years old or more, that lead remains in the paint and kids, little kids in those houses pick at the peeling paint and put it in their mouths. And we found this example in Oakland it's, a, it's actually a really uh, heart-rending example of, uh, and this is a video uh, of a little guy, Antonio, and his father. This is a man who, uh, it's 
unclear exactly what relationship he has to uh, Antonio genetically, but he has become his, this guy's father, and he is wonderful, and takes him everywhere, mainly to appointments with therapists and doctors. Uh, he's lost, little Antonio has lost hearing because of lead paint, and he's way behind. The, the therapist that he worked with uh, explains in this, in this video that when she first saw him, she thought he had all the appearance in terms of actions and and capabilities of a three-month-old, and he was 18 months old. But through the therapy, through the work, and through the enormous and wonderful attention of this, this fellow, this, his dad, he's coming on. He's starting to fight his way back. But it showed the devastation that, that, that lead paint can still bring to, uh, to children. We did a story for the San Francisco Chronicle about Black infant mortality, which is just shockingly high still in this country. It's double the rate of any other group. And uh, uh, researchers have worked for decades to try to figure out what, what's going on, and they have made little progress. But there is a program in Alameda County in North, Northern California that is very proactive. It goes out. It doesn't simply react. It doesn't sit in its laboratories and offices. And the result of this has been astounding. They have cut the black infant mortality rate in Alameda County, which is incidentally the county that has the highest uh, number of African Americans of any county in the state. Uh, and uh, there's, a, as, I say, as we say here, a hint of promise going forward. This is another story about kids. This was our most impactful, one of our most impactful and celebrated efforts. We uh, scoured data, state data, about uh, access to dental care for poor children in the state, especially in the managed care area. We found that both Sacramento and, Sac and Los Angeles County children had among the worst access of anywhere in the state to dental care. Uh, why did they? Because they had managed care operations, which calls into some question about what is managed care all about. Managed care operations that got paid whether or not they saw the kids. And guess what? They didn't. So as a result of these stories, a series of almost 20 stories in all, uh, published in the Sacramento Bee, uh, a, a number of legislators were outraged by this and undertook to propose legislation, which was passed and which hopefully will uh, assure that kids like this will receive dental treatment uh, with, uh, with alacrity. This, uh, this project won a, a state award for one of the for best uh, investigative feature. I want to turn to another category. Uh, again, my categories, uh, not anything for, more formal. But this is uh, about the elderly, at the other end of the spectrum, from children to the elderly. This is a story that we did. Uh, this took us almost a year of work. We worked, we partnered with the uh, San Diego Union Tribune. And this concerned a very weak oversight by state agency on assisted living facilities. We found a number of uh, deaths that had never been made public, deaths due to neglect. We found all kinds of, of problems with medication, wrong dosage, overdosage under dosage, et cetera. We found that there was very little training given to workers in these, in these homes, that in fact there was no requirement, virtually no requirement they have any medical training at all. There were no uh, nurses or, or physician assistants in any of these homes, no requirement for that either. Uh, so the result of this uh, work, which w was a fall three-part series followed up by a uh, December two-part series this past year, the uh, result was that Legislators again became outraged and produced no, more, no fewer than a dozen bills to uh, go before the legislature this year. They held hearings in February. They held another hearing this, this week, on Tuesday of this week. And uh, this thing is moving toward change, big time change, where there will be uh, new rules, new inspection rules, new uh, 
many, much higher fines than we're currently uh, than are currently on the books. Uh, a number of changes that, that the hope is will will correct some of these uh, egregious uh, problems in, in oversight uh, of these homes. And by the way, there are 7,800 of these homes in the state of California. Here are the stories as they appeared in the, in the uh, UT San Diego Sunday section. This was the front page. It was kind of a lead into the story. It wasn't the story itself. And then they had a whole special section. I think it was uh, eight or 12 pages long. They also had six videos with this story. And I should know the answer to this, but uh, is there a place on the site that describes the work of the uh, of the center, of, of the work that you're doing, so that it kind of puts it in a capsule? Yeah, I mean, for example, if I wanted to walk into the Ford Foundation next week and said, "Hey, you know," and I, you know, I, I followed pretty closely the, the work that you do, but I didn't realize, you know, I didn't realize the extent. Well, you, you've nailed it, no. And, uh, it's pretty remarkable. And I, I would love to be able to, you know, if I go to the Ford Foundation or you know, talk to physicians or I'm talking to my clubs, but have like a one sheet. I'll get it to you. And, it, and you're right, it should be on the site, too. I think that would just be, would be helpful. Uh, that's, that's a special order. We'll take care of that. That's a, that's a really good idea. Um, so these are the findings. I won't, I've already gone over them, so I won't do that. Uh, and this is the results. And I, as I said this last week, it, uh, they had another meeting and decided to push these bills forward. So something's going to happen by uh, end of fiscal, of fiscal year. Uh, this was an, a piece we did uh, that is one of my favorites because we did it with nine ethnic media organizations, each one of whom well, maybe with a couple of exceptions, is, is way too understaffed to do it by themselves. We worked with a number of Asian uh, uh, media uh, operations. We worth, worked with an African-American one we, uh, uh, and three or four Latino operations, both in L.A. and in Orange County, uh, to put this together. And the story, very quickly, was that these adult day health care centers were going to be axed by the state. This is during the tough budget years in 2010, 2011. And they were going to be axed. And these centers, the majority of these centers were in minority areas. They were mainly in Southern California. There were a couple hundred of these centers, and most of them were in Southern California. And I like to think that through what we did is we, we, just, we wrote the spine story, the big picture story of what, what it was all about, the history of it, the context of it, and what was likely to happen. Uh, each of the uh, ethnic uh, newspapers or media uh, folks contributed their own side story about their own specific area. And the result was a, uh, and, we, uh, and we decided that anybody could use any or all of those stories. And they used uh, quite a few of them, not only their own ethnicity, they used some other stories as well in their publications. We like to think that this uh, played a role in easing this transition from adult day health care to another system called CBAS, which is not as user friendly and doesn't allow as much uh, time in these centers as these did. I, again, I have a video that I'm not going to bother to show you because it, you won't be able to hear it, but it's of a, an 85-year-old woman, in, in a uh, Filipino-American woman who is in one of these centers who just says, what will I do if I can't spend my five days a week at the center? What will I do? And she says, and this is where I pluck the title, she says, I will be home. I will be home alone. Uh, another area we're spending a lot of time on is mental illness. This was a project we did in the Modesto area, Stanislaus County, which had suffered unbelievable cuts in their mental health services. And we had our multimedia reporter uh, it was her idea to take very stark black and white photos of people who, were, who said they were mentally ill and did not want to be uh, stigmatized for it and were willing to go on camera to make sure that the world knew it was okay to be mentally ill. So these are just a few of those individuals who agreed to be photoed. 
we had a rigmarole with the county who wanted to say, well, you can't do that. These are people under our charge. And we said, are they uh, in any kind of uh, conservatorship, or can they make decisions on their own? And in fact, of course, they could. These were people out in the community. Many of them held jobs. They could make their own decision about what they wanted to say or not to say. This was a, uh, another real deep dive project we did with the San Diego Union Tribune. We spent six or seven months on the streets of San Diego. Uh, talking to uh, individuals on the streets and emergency room physicians and emergency uh, medical service people about the problem of frequent users in the medical emergency system. Uh, quick statistic, in San Diego, according to the medical director's office, 1,136 people out of a population of 1.2 or 1.3 million, 1,136 people spent in ambulance and paramedic charges and ER entry $20 million in 2012. So it was one, it was an eighth hundredth of 1% of the population spent 17% of EMS services. So we went in and examined who these people were, followed them in their lives, uh, explored uh, the impact on the patients, on the EMS delivery people and the ER doctors, and also explored an attempt down there to end that cycle of use. And this is uh, the last one I'll show you. Uh, this is a recent project. It, it appeared in the Sacramento Bee just in February. Our uh, reporter found that uh, the hospitalization rate of, of the hospitalization of youths 21 and under uh, over the last five years in the uh, state of California had increased 38%. In this figure, the professionals didn't know either. Nobody was aware of this, and they tried to figure out what the reasons were for it, and uh, they simply said that they're not receiving adequate, that um, California's youth is not receiving adequate mental health services uh, either before they spiral into crisis or after they come home from the hospital as the result of the crisis. So we tried to bring this issue as close to the reader as we could. We had a, a video of this, of this young man who was taken to the hospital uh, because he had, he had had an episode that he, he couldn't get out from under uh, and was very eloquent in his uh, description of what had happened to him. So that's what the center is, and that's what we do. And if there's anybody left around to uh, ask questions, have at it. Thank you. Gave a number at, at the beginning. Of Seven. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, we have three senior writers, a multimedia journalist. We're going to have another senior writer, but we're going to hire soon, and uh, Roger Smith, my edit managing editor, and myself. That's it. But our but don't forget our staff also consists of our partners' staffs, so they contribute a reporter, a, a photojournalist. Uh, uh, they read behind us as editors, although most, most often most of our stuff goes in fairly un, untouched by the other end. And, and how do you negotiate with, with a newspaper um, to, for them to give up resources? Um, I mean, uh, are, are, uh, well, it's in their interest. How do you, what do you offer and what do they offer? How do you, how do you pull that we, um We offer a lot. I mean, we are, it's the best deal in history. Yeah. They spend, uh, they may have to have some reporter hours spent, their reporters uh, or their photographers, on a story that's going to be a front page, incredibly high quality for, for uh, in many of the cases, the highest quality of anything they do all year, right. given resource uh, allocations and all. Uh, we don't charge a penny to, for the work, and if you tabbed it up, you know, on a, on a project like the one in San Diego, the, the, uh, uh, frequent user project. He was down there. He was down there six months, wow. staying in hotels three, four days a week, for six months. Um, so we're talking tens of thousands of dollars that we spend uh, for them to get the dividend of having a five-part series on a major problem. That and this comes from the foundation. 
I mean, we have a budget. We have a we have an annual budget and uh, and spend it as we will. Um, sometimes you really wish there were. A, oftentimes, because of because of the lack of resources that these papers have now, uh, all media, um, um, they just can't contribute much. Uh, so we're we're stuck holding it, and we're happy to do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just see a parallel with, as you might assume, yeah. environment writing. Mm -hmm. um, they were the first people to get, get kicked out. Well, you're right. And so, um, as a result, there's very little decent environmental coverage, and yet there are you know, huge issues. They're only going to get huger. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And resources just keep shrinking. So. Yeah. No, we, we, you know, when we walk into newsrooms, uh, typically they're half empty. They're just half empty. There's, uh, there are whole sections. They don't even have desks anymore. So, so we, we fill a very uh, strong need. Give them, uh, nobody does projects anymore except at the largest papers. And we, uh, we come in and fill that need for them.